Good morning and welcome everyone. This is the third in our series of education sessions uh, to help get everyone prepared right for course. All cameras are off. Uh, say again. Yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, if everybody mute could everyone. mute their things, uh, we're going to structure this so there will be Q&As all the way through. Yep, yep, yep. So I've got everyone muted but us. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, so I think I know everyone that's on the call right now, but for those that I haven't met, uh, quick introduction. My name is Bertram Allen, and I chair the Columbia Yacht Club Cruising Fleet for 2021. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we do have a few, uh, quite a few participants that are on the call. So we're going to keep everyone muted uh, during the call. If you do have a question, uh, just raise your hand and uh, we'll find a moment to pause and address your question uh, with your raised hand flag. If you're wondering how to do that, uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a little button that says reaction. If you click on reactions and then click on raise hand, uh, that will that'll flag us that you have a question. Uh, lastly, uh, we are recording this call. Uh, it will be posted for members of the club to view. Uh, if you don't wanna be on a recorded call, now is the time to drop. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce Paul Yule. I think everybody knows Paul. Uh, Paul's going to be our presenter for the day. Thanks, Bert. Good way, Paul. Yeah, no, excited to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, uh, we'll start with some introductions here. But uh, I've been uh, a member of Columbia Yacht Club since uh, 20, 2001. So this is my 21st year as a member of Columbia Yacht Club. Uh, coincidentally, uh, I was the cruising fleet chair for a little over 10 years as well. Um, I've been sailing and racing out of uh, Chicago for actually closer to 35 years now. And I'm also a licensed Coast Guard captain. And over the years, uh, probably the past 10, 15 years, I've also been teaching uh, adult sailing, everything from skip jacks all the way up through uh, advanced adult sailing and racing and through one of my company's agar expeditions we teach uh, long distance offshore passage making uh, on the great lakes um, also part of that is did a lot of cruising with kids <laughs> that's a whole nother topic uh, that we can if you want to talk about at some point uh, we can talk about what it's like to cruise with kids, but uh, the one in the middle, he started sailing when uh, he was three months old. We uh, took him off cruising around Lake Michigan, and the other three followed. This is obviously one of my favorite uh, pictures. Uh, after a, a squirt gun fight in the middle of Lake Michigan on our way to uh, uh, Saugatuck one summer. So, we're going to talk about passage making today. Uh, this is, a, I do two presentations at the Chicago Boat Show. And today's presentation is a hybrid of those two presentations. Uh, so it's a little bit longer, a little bit more involved because we have some more time today uh, than we do at the Boat Show. Uh, but we're going to talk about essentially uh, longer distance sailing. And this was really targeted to originally to individuals who would take their boat outside of Chicago's harbor, go sailing up and down the lakefront for the day and come back uh, and not make any passages across the lake or get too far up Lake Michigan. And I realized that many years ago when I was uh, running cruising fleet, uh, it suggested that we do 4th of July in South Haven and nobody wanted to go. And at that point, I realized most of our members had never uh, crossed Lake Michigan or weren't confident enough to make a long distance passage. Because in addition to sailing to South Haven, I had suggested we do it at nighttime. Uh, so that's kind of where uh, all this is coming from, is to build your confidence on uh, pushing that envelope just a little bit more. So. Passage making really is easy. If you do it once or twice, you're gonna say, geez, I should have done that years ago. This is kind of what we 
think about. Let's uh, go to the Caribbean uh, and uh, sail from island to island and have some sundowners, maybe do some snorkeling, right? It's a lot of fun. This is what we're looking for. And yes, it is a lot of fun. So today we're going to talk about the realities and what's truly involved in uh, doing longer distance passages. And the focus of this is really on doing passages of more than 48 hours nonstop. So we're talking three days, two days, three days, maybe four days at most. We're not going to be talking about transatlantic passages or island hopping across the Pacific. We're going to do something a little bit closer to home. So what is passage making? This is uh, kind of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. And we're gonna start with the very first topic there. But before we get into that, um, Bert, if you could open up everybody's microphone uh, or unmute them, I'd really like to get a sense of what the experience of the people here today is. So. Uh, let me know when that's ready. I'd like to know here who owns a boat or for that matter, who does not own a boat. Anybody? <laughs> Everybody own a boat? No, I don't. You don't? Okay. No, I've, I've been crewing on other people's boats uh, around Chicago for 30 some years. I've yes. done 30 max, uh, mostly out of Chicago Yacht Club. So you're, you're, oh, the, you're the smarter one. You don't own a boat. <laughs> hey, those things are expensive. <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> um, anybody else? Anybody timeshare uh, who doesn't own a boat or they rent a boat? Uh, Ron Voisard in the club since 2008. Various committees and have done night sailing over to uh, South Haven. Awesome. Hey, Ron. Good to see you here. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to switch the next question around instead of who has sailed across the lake, who has not, what we're really getting at here is, is who hasn't done any really distance sailing, who hasn't crossed the lake, who has not sailed at night, anybody? I'll take that as a unanimous everybody has. Um, who well, has I've, so I've, I've crossed the lake and I've sailed at night, but I haven't crossed the lake at night. Okay. Okay. I think night sailing is one of the greatest experiences. Um, who uh, has made, who has not made a nonstop passage of more than 24 hours? That would, that would be me as well. Okay. Anybody else? How many, how many people do we have here? Uh, uh, right now we've got 19 on the call. Awesome. So, uh, 18 of you have done a passage of more than 24 hours. It sounds like. Okay. Or, or they, we can't figure out how to get everybody off mute. So, uh, <laughs> well, our focus is going to be on making, like I said, making passages of, of, you know, more than 48 hours. So we're talking 48, 72, uh, 84, um, whether it be 96 would be somewhere in that range. So if most of you have done Mac races, a lot of this is going to be um, uh, pretty familiar. So in that context, what is passage making? Uh, I think we've just kind of explained that, that uh, it's multi-day trips. Um, probably even in the context of going from uh, let's say Charleston, South Carolina to the Bahamas, that's about a, a four day trip. So this would apply to that as well. Um, I'd like to have people uh, talk a little bit about in their mind, uh, the process that you go through, this isn't, I want people to contribute to this, what is the process you go through when you think about planning for a day sale, for instance? Anybody? Weather window. Weather, okay, that's a good one, yeah. What else? Provisioning, okay. whether or not your friends that you're inviting, if you are inviting friends, 
have any sailing experience or have any ill effects when sailing. Okay, so skills, yeah. Foods and drinks, weather, anything else? Crew. Crew, okay, so that goes right with skills, yeah. Provisions. Got provisions. Safety and equipment check. Okay. About awareness of underwater debris. Underwater debris. Okay, that's an interesting one. Rum. Hitting something. What else? Brad said rum. Rum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to add that to food and drink. <laughs> what is it uh, that uh, you said? If, if, if you don't like the rum, you, you haven't had enough? Uh, exactly. always, have, always have a good medical kit. First aid kit, excellent. I like that one. Anybody else? Figure out where you're going and Sorry. and figure out where you're going and what the traffic is. Okay, so uh, a a cruising plan, knowing where you're going. Probably, I would assume being becoming familiar with uh, where you're going to go to. Safety gear, PFDs. And we got that, okay. The one thing that I've, I've seen so far that we really haven't brought up is the boat. That comes in handy. A boat comes in handy. Uh, do you think about uh, whether your fuel tank is topped up? Uh, are there any mechanical related issues with the boat? Are there any little projects that you need to do before you go? Um, is the, like in uh, Bert's case, is the roller furling working properly? Uh, things like that. The boat is your vehicle, right? We don't think about that too much when we jump in an automobile. We just kind of turn the key and go. But with a boat, you know, are my sheets okay? Is the standing rigging okay? So, yeah, these are uh, basically the high level uh, topics for just going out for a day sail. It's exactly the same for distance sailing, only um, like uh, uh, was said a couple weeks ago at the first aid uh, thing is the further you go, the more stuff you're going to need, uh, the more things you're going to have to think about and consider. But the planning process is pretty much the same. So I always think that the accumulation of small problems are the most dangerous. Sure, uh, somebody mentioned uh, hitting underwater debris uh, on the Great Lakes. And if you stay out of shipping channels on the ocean, that's a very extremely rare occurrence. It's something to consider, but it's usually the accumulation of small issues over time that uh, get you into trouble. And a great example is uh, let's say you're on a boat and the wind picks up and you come up on a deck and you're not wearing a PFD. Uh, there's, a, there's an issue. You're not thinking about your own safety. What if you go forward on the boat without your PFD in rough weather? Is there anybody there to watch you? Is there a backup person to make sure that you're okay? Why aren't you wearing a PFD? Do you have jack lines on the boat? Do you have a tether? to keep you on the boat. So it's these adding uh, multiple layers of safety that help you to cruise long distances more safely. Schedules. You're gonna hear this theme a lot. The cruising is about being flexible. Schedules are your enemy. Uh, we had a cruising fleet event, like I said, to South Haven, and we were going to leave at nine o'clock at night, but there were storms coming down the lake. Some people went, some people didn't go. You need to build flexibility into your cruising plan. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, having, uh, knowing where you're going. Uh, so route planning and timing becomes very important. Uh, not only about when you're going to leave, but when are you going to arrive? So for instance, if you're coming in, let's say to a port on the east side of Lake Michigan, 
are you going to be coming in at seven o'clock in the morning with the sun in your eyes? Or do you want to arrive at a more opportunity, a more opportune point where the sun is going to be behind you so that you can actually see uh, more clearly where you're headed into? Um, if you're headed into a shallow area, you might want the sun overhead so that you can actually see what's underneath the boat. Uh, that's more typical in the Pacific and uh, uh, reef areas. Plan B, uh, if you have a part of your route, uh, you should have uh, an idea where uh, other safe harbors are in the case the weather deteriorates and you can duck into. These are layers of safety. We already talked about daytime, nighttime arrival. Do you want to arrive at a port uh, in the middle of the night that you're unfamiliar with? It's a good question. Leaving a float plan behind, especially for longer distance trips, it is uh, somewhat important. You can leave it with friends, uh, establish some check-in times uh, with the understanding that uh, there might be some flexibility involved in, in when you might arrive. So create a, a time range that you might arrive. Um, also, obviously, emergency contacts. Lake Michigan does have shipping lanes. Uh, you can see them on your charts. Uh, if you're out in the Chesapeake or uh, let's say down in Miami area or Los Angeles, uh, there are uh, other zones that you really need to stay out of. That's where the freighters and stuff uh, particularly travel. Um, there are, for those that you haven't crossed Lake Michigan or done a lot of night long distance sailing, uh, the big freighters and stuff on Lake Michigan at nighttime, they look like cities coming at you. They're pretty easy to identify, uh, but we do need to keep a watch. Probably one of the key elements uh, is staying warm, dry, and hydrated. And I'm not talking about rum, they're uh, bread. <laughs> We're talking about water. Uh, those will get you uh, safely over long distances. I think, uh, what is it? Uh, you can go a couple of days without water. Uh, you can go probably a week without food, but staying warm and dry are, are really, really, really critical. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about food and water provisioning. Uh, need to think about how many days. I don't know about some of you guys, but I find when I'm cruising, uh, especially on MAC races, my food consumption is cut in half. I eat a lot less than I would normally do on land. Maybe I should go sailing more. That would get rid of the COVID roll, I think. Um, and then think about the climate. Now, an interesting thing, um, I've been on 16 MAC races, and I remember times uh, middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, sailing along with uh, a t-shirt and shorts. And other MAC races, I've got a base layer of long underwear, top and uh, long underwear pants, uh, heavy socks, sea boots, uh, then a mid layer like fleece pants, a fleece top, and then full follies with a woolen hat that comes down over the e ears and a neck fleece, fleece neck gaiter and insulated gloves because it was so cold and damp. So weather kind of impacts that around here, but think about the climate. Obviously, if you're gonna be in the Caribbean, it's a whole different setup than it is up here. Uh, but what I'm just describing, that was mid-July up here in the, uh, on Lake Michigan. Weather windows, yes, <laughs> the weather always wins. And again, you need to be flexible here. Like I was describing uh, that particular trip across Lake Michigan at um, nine o'clock, we saw storms actually going from the north uh, down due south along the Michigan coast. So we said, ah, let's take a nap. Got up around midnight, one o'clock. And it looked like the storms were dissipating. So we shoved off. Well, we got halfway across the lake and of course they started up again um, and uh, created uh, uh, an issue. Uh, we ended up actually coming back to Chicago. You can, if, if you're setting up a weather plan, uh, looking at weather windows, looking out 24 hours is 
pretty reliable. 48 hours, you start getting a little bit more variability. Uh, obviously, longer term forecasts, you need to bring something with you uh, so you can stay updated. When I do, uh, when I start looking at weather windows for, uh, let's say, a two day passage, I start looking at the NOAA forecast about a week in advance. And it's not really so much to see if we're going to go uh, uh, and, and leave in a week. I'm really looking at the weather pattern to see whether that weather system that we think is going to occur in a week is actually going to arrive sooner or if it's going to arrive later. So if we're going to leave on a, well, you don't leave on a Friday, but if we leave on a Friday, I would look at the weather uh, a week ahead of time. And then I would look at it again on Saturday and I would look at it again on Sunday and probably again on Monday to see whether that weather system that we think is coming is actually going to get here sooner or later. And that might force us to adjust our departure time. As we get closer, yeah, we start looking at it uh, a bit more granularly, probably three, four days out uh, to see exactly what's going to be occurring when we think we want to depart. Uh, this isn't really appropriate for our discussion, but if you haven't seen uh, Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Routes, it's a really interesting look at uh, globally, um, month by month, what the uh, traditional uh, wind direction and strength is for a specific area, pretty much on the planet, uh, obviously the oceans. Uh, and you can see this one is for uh, sailing from Norfolk, Virginia to St. Martin in November. That's usually when the Caribbean 1500 takes off and a lot of boat deliveries are going down to the islands. You can see that the winds are predominantly out of the north, uh, looks like uh, northeast, uh, east northeast, and a little bit out of due east. So heading uh, kind of southeast, you can see you're going to be on a beam reach most of the way. Um, with the incidence of winds out of other quadrants being very, very low. So it's an interesting uh, book. It's not cheap, but it's a very interesting book to look at. Yeah, preparation. We just talked about that, didn't we? Uh, weather, food, crew skills and safety, first aid, uh, having a cruising plan, hitting things. Um, a lot of times, you know, we forget about uh, checking the through hulls and uh, uh, issues like that during the summer. So, boat prep. This is why I brought up the boat. What are the condition of your batteries? Are they old? We're not going to get into electrical systems today because that's really a whole different topic. But what are the conditions of your batteries? Do you have enough battery capacity uh, to sail through the night with your electronics running? Are you running a refrigerator? Uh, what, you know, are you going to be able to get through the night without running your engine? Running rigging, what's the condition? Have you inspected it lately? Uh, if you have an older boat like a lot of us do, you know, it could be 30, 40 years old. Are there any issues there? Uh, with your, well, primarily with your standing rigging. Running rigging, uh, inspect for chafe, obviously. Make sure it's in good condition. This one, uh, how often do, do all of you check your entire steering system? Most of us have uh, cables on quadrants. Um, my last boat had a, a gear drive system. It didn't have a cable. Uh, do you know where your emergency tiller is? Do you know how to use it? Uh, most emergency tillers on sailboats are really afterthoughts. And if you had to use one uh, in a bad sea state, uh, you'll find out how inadequate they truly are. Uh, so for longer distance passages, you know, if you're crossing Lake Michigan, it may not be so much of an issue. But if you're going to be doing three, four day trip, uh, especially maybe from uh, Charleston or the East Coast down to the Bahamas, it's going to be a bit more of an issue. And in those particular cases, more than four days, I'd say, um, you know, we have uh, electric autopilots. 
Um, I would recommend that they be connected directly to the rudder post or the quadrant and not your steering wheel. If the cable on your steering wheel uh, breaks and your uh, autopilot is connected to the wheel, uh, to your steering wheel, you absolutely have no steerage. Wind vanes, uh, it's a whole nother topic and really more for long distance cruising, uh, but uh, important components there. Uh, to me, the two most important things I've found on, on boats have been roller furling head sails. Yes, I sailed before uh, uh, they had those. Uh, it's like having an extra person on the boat, uh, lightens the workload on having to go forward. And for long distance uh, sailing, uh, a wind or steering vane is, is like that, that crew that can steer for 24 hours nonstop. Most of us can drive for two to four hours and then we really have to switch off. Through hulls, how many of you exercise and check your through hulls every spring? These can fail. Bilge pumps, uh, make sure they're operational, obviously. Uh, go through the ship's safety equipment. We're not talking about the first aid kit here yet, but you know, uh, um, flares, fire extinguishers, uh, things of that nature. Uh, you could probably throw jack lines in there as well. Your ground tackle, uh, if you're gonna be distance sailing, uh, chances are you're gonna be crude, you're gonna be anchoring out somewhere. Maybe you're gonna go up to the Manitous or Beaver Island, uh, Fox Island, hang out up there, anchor off uh, some of the, uh, the dunes and stuff, spend the day there. Uh, a windless starts to become uh, an issue here. Uh, if any of you have, uh, have all chain anchor roads, trying to uh, bring up your ground tackle can be quite a physical challenge. So consider that for uh, what your setup is for longer distance sailing. And remember, um, you need at least five to one, if not seven to one, uh, plus the the depth from the water to the deck of the boat uh, to have uh, a secure set of ground tackle for your anchoring uh, when you're cruising. It's not like anchoring off the Chicago's lakefront. Make sure your sails are in good condition, that they slide up and down. Uh, the roller furling is working properly. You know, check the uh, your traveler. Um, make sure that's all lubricated and, and working properly. The little uh, Maryland balls and, and stuff, they can get flat sections in them over age uh, and might prevent them, uh, your travelers from running uh, properly and smoothly. Um, make sure your blocks are in good shape. So these are all kind of things we, we do in the spring, but should be periodically checked throughout the summer. Nav lights work. I uh, hope everybody has switched over to LED bulbs. Uh, they are incredible. Uh, when I first switched over from incandescent to LEDs, uh, I got a, uh, probably a good eight to 10 times more um, uh, battery life uh, for night sailing. Uh, first Mac that we had LED lights, we didn't run our, uh, the auxiliary at all. Before then, we were running it pretty regularly. Electronics are cool. Um, every, probably everybody has uh, chart plotters or multifunction displays. Please make sure you bring charts um, for the area you're, you're uh, cruising in, along with uh, detailed charts for the harbors and uh, the entrances. Probably part of that too, if you're cruising in areas you're unfamiliar with, a uh, coastal pilot and a light list would be good to have as backups. The coastal pilot for you don't understand what that is. Uh, it's a pretty thick book, but it gives you a very detailed description of uh, what the, uh, the area around the harbor looks like. So it'll describe towers, it'll describe land contours, anything distinguishable that you uh, can see from uh, the water. Light list is pretty clear. I believe you can go online and just download that. Uh, that gets mm -hmm. updated periodically. 
I don't think paper charts and uh, the pilot uh, are really required to be updated that frequently. Stuff on Lake Michigan doesn't change all that, that frequently. Make sure your fuel and water is topped up. Uh, you might want to be bringing extra water if you're going to be, uh, say, look, you're going to sail up past Mac Island and, and you're going to go cruising for uh, two or three weeks up in the North Channel. Uh, you're going to need up at the North Channel, you're pretty much uh, on your own. So you have to bring everything uh, with you, included uh, additional water. Around here, I don't recommend uh, water makers on boats. They chew up a lot of energy and you're usually close enough to some place where you can get fresh water anyway. Obviously bring uh, spare oil, antifreeze, uh, if you need it for your boat, uh, filters. Um, and probably just as important, uh, know how to do an oil change or a fuel filter change or an oil filter change yourself. Learn how to bleed your engine. It does happen. Uh, where you would need to get the air out of your uh, fuel system. Uh, for obviously for your engine, impeller and belts, bring spare parts. And I would recommend uh, storing them very neatly. Uh, look for uh, chafe in your running rigging. Uh, we kind of talked about that on the other side here. Build your maintenance skills. Um, you're on your own. It's, it's not like if there's an issue with your car, you can just pull it over to the side of the road and step out. Uh, get out of the car and get on the phone and call AAA. Uh, you have to become more self-reliant. Uh, most diesel engines and stuff um, are relatively bulletproof. I've had over 35 years, I've had few issues with uh, uh, the auxiliaries on my boats. I added this in, this was not in previous presentations, but um, I'm a big fan of reflective tape and glow-in-the-dark tape. Uh, you can go to Home Depot and get a roll of duct tape, uh, glow-in-the-dark duct tape. Yeah, it's, it's about yay wide. And uh, in the evening, you can hit it with a flashlight and it will stay, it will glow all night long. It's really cool stuff if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's great to put it, uh, put little dabs on, on things that are important that you want to see at nighttime if you're going to be sailing at night. Uh, you can also write on it. Uh, so it becomes a glow in the dark label. Uh, it has so many uses. I finally put it in this presentation. You can also go to the sports store and you can get that reflective tape like you see on your clothes or your shoes and stuff. Uh, I like to put little pieces on the ends of my telltales. So when I'm sailing at night, I can take a really low voltage red uh, light, shine it up the, uh, uh, the leech of the sail, and those little reflective tapes, they light up like daytime. Uh, it makes it very much easier to uh, trim the sails. And of course, it has other uh, purposes. Long distance sailing. Since you're going to be uh, sleeping on the boat while it's underway, I can't tell you how important lee cloths are. Uh, I'm not going to go into how to make them, um, but just know they keep you in your bunk. Uh, take a look for that if you don't know what those are. Um, but you definitely want to fabricate lee cloths. Diagram of the boat. Um, I don't think this is necessarily the best diagram, but the reason it's in the presentation is what I do like about it is how they've color coded the various different things. So if I'm looking for a fire extinguisher, I know it's a star and I can find it real quickly on this diagram. Most of the boat diagrams I've seen, they're just black and white and they just have numbers or a little descriptive text, which forces you to read every little thing to find out what you're looking for. Make things intuitive, dumb them down so that anybody can look at a, a diagram like this and say, oh, seacocks, oh, those are the blue dots. Oh, I can find those real quick. So, should be of the boat interior, obviously locate all your safety equipment, uh, 
You might even have a drawer that has uh, cutting devices, knives, or a hacksaw, uh, things like that. So you have to customize this for your own boat. Man overboard procedures. I truly believe that staying on the boat is much better than trying to recover someone who's not, who's fallen off the boat. But it's still important to understand um, various man overboard techniques, whether it's quick stop, figure eight. Uh, that's just getting back to the person, but in a rough sea state, <clears throat> um, try getting a 200 person, 200 pound person back on the boat in six or eight foot seas. <clears throat> it's quite a challenge. Uh, that's why I fully believe coming up with methods to keep you on the boat is far better than trying to recover someone. But if someone does go overboard, make sure that if you're doing a distance sail that you've practiced some of these techniques. And, you know, obviously if you've got to use the engine to get back to somebody, just remember the prop. Uh, it's okay to use the engine, but make sure it's not spinning around. You don't want to uh, complicate <laughs> A recovery situation by hurting somebody. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if, uh, Bert, if we should um, maybe open up some questions. I had kind of planned to stop this periodically to have people uh, uh, ask some questions. I can see we, we're starting to run out of time, maybe. Anybody? Um, unmute myself here. Uh, so unfortunately, it doesn't look like I have the ability to unmute all. So if you have a question, just uh, click on your, your icon that shows your name and click unmute and feel free to just go ahead and ask away. I'd just like to reinforce one of the points on the last slide. Uh, about being able to change your belts and having the right equipment and doing things like that. It's a minor repair, but when you get back from doing a crossing and you're pulling into the harbor and your belt breaks and you can't dock, uh, it's pretty handy to be able to have that, uh, that skill and the tools and the backup parts for it. Um, just little things like that, I, I find make life easier. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, when, uh, and let me just touch on that real briefly. We were coming back from Oh, I don't know if it was New Buffalo, Michigan, but uh, we we're motor sailing to Chicago and halfway across the engine died and left me scratching my head, started up the engine. It ran just fine. We got uh, all the way, uh, we're still motor sailing. We got to uh, uh, Monroe Harbor, the breakwater. And just as we're going through the break, the opening, the engine dies again. And uh, at that point, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience sailing up to cans. I was starting to think about that plan B. Do I sail up to a can or do they keep going to uh, DeSable Harbor? So one of the things that you might on, on that note, you know, if the belt breaks and you don't have an auxiliary engine, in my case, uh, we had air in the fuel line. Um, and we couldn't rely on the engine to function properly. The just having knowing that I have that skill to be able to sail up to a can or up to a dock uh, without using the engine gave me a lot of confidence and security in knowing I had various different options to me. So, yeah, next question. Anybody? And I know as we're talking about getting prepared uh, and making sure you're ready for a passage, you know, that same, that same vein that you're, you're talking about as far as fuel. I know I'd run into some issues with, with fuel contamination issues. And part of my, part of my checklist is uh, I built a, a small polishing system. So mm -hmm. bought a, a Raycor filter off of eBay and a cheap, you know, automotive uh, fuel pump. And before I get started, I go through a process and I drop that in the tank and I let it run for about an hour just to clean out any contaminants, uh, knowing that if there is anything that's been uh, growing over the, during the week in the fuel tank or some dirt that got in there, uh, that I, I took care of that issue before I actually set out on the lake. Uh, 
because like you said, as you're coming through the brake wall, it's an absolutely horrible place for your engine to die on you. Uh, so taking care of those fuel, fuel issues and checking them out before getting on the lake is, is good. Yeah, and that's, that's, huge. Uh, that's a bigger issue when you're sailing in foreign countries. Uh, yeah. They'll pre -filter, you should pre-filter your, your diesel because you don't know how long it's been sitting there. You don't know if there are microbes floating around, you know, swimming. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, that can be an issue. I, I highly recommend the, uh, the Raycar fuel filters, especially uh, having two. Mm -hmm. So if one gets clogged up, you can just switch over to the other one and then uh, replace the filter or do what you need to do with the clogged one. Yeah, good point. These are, these are all little things that you can build in to increase uh, your safety levels. Any other questions on pre-planning? If not, I'm gonna keep going here. Uh, safety and equipment, BH radio, BHF radio, DSC has become uh, more and more of a standard found on uh, handhelds and also uh, ship radios. Uh, know how to use DSC. Uh, we don't use it that frequently. So it's kind of like first aid, you know, if you had a first aid class five years ago, <laughs> you might want to uh, take a refresher. Same thing with DSC, just because we don't really, really use it that much. Um, if you're um, sailing offshore, um, SSB radio is really the, the, uh, what uh, the cruisers uh, use, and it doesn't require a license or certification. Uh, so uh, once you become familiar with how to um, actually use an SSB radio, uh, uh, they're cheap. Uh, well, it's a little expensive to get into, but they're cheap to operate and uh, keep you in communication. Uh, ham radios you don't really find on, on boats that much anymore. Radar uh, is good, especially around the Great Lakes. Uh, it does get foggy out there. Um, I can remember uh, doing a Mac race and uh, it's two o'clock in the morning and it was so foggy, I could barely see the, the bow of the, uh, the 36 foot 36 boat I was driving. And of course we're out there with hundreds of other boats. So radar uh, on the Great Lakes uh, can be very, very useful. Radar reflectors, Deflector. I guess I need to fix that. Uh, radar reflectors. Um, no. Yeah, they can help. <laughs> um, and then uh, AIS is kind of new. Um, most of the commercial ships, in fact, I think all the commercial ships are required to have AIS. We're starting to see it a little bit more on recreational boats. Uh, we'll get into the various classes. Your first aid kit. Um, just like two weeks ago, the further you go, the more stuff you're gonna need in your first aid kit. If you're just going out off Chicago for the day, you know, some Band-Aids and uh, something, if you get a cut to close up the wound so you can get back into shore real quickly is all you need. Uh, my first aid kit is a small duffel bag and uh, it's, fairly, fairly good. But the key I have is that um, the different types of materials I have in my uh, first aid kit are put in plastic boxes so that each different element is compartmentalized. So regular little band-aids might be in one box and there's a label on it with the glow in the dark tape. <laughs> and uh, uh, then another one might have um, uh, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, splints uh, and so on. Another one might have uh, a flashlight, a first aid book, and uh, just some basic uh, uh, things like that. So think about how far you're going and um, how far you're going to be from uh, being able to get help. And that will influence, you know, the type of first aid kit you're gonna have. Most of the ones in the boat store are inadequate. Uh, they are a good starting point, but are inadequate for offshore sailing. And for those that are on the call that weren't able to join the first uh, uh, cruising seminar that we did a few weeks ago with Bob Cohn, 
Uh, just keep in mind that is recorded. Uh, we did that on first date at sea, and it does cover, uh, you know, what you should have in your first aid kit and some basic first aid techniques that you might want to keep in mind when sailing. So that's something that's available to go back and reference. Yeah, and if you're going to be, uh, let's say you're a couple and uh, you're going to bring uh, some friends with you and you're going to, let's say, for instance, you're going to go up to the North Channel for a couple of weeks, it would be really good for them to put together a medical history and medical needs um, in, you know, typewritten form and put it in a sealed envelope and, and keep it uh, close by on the ship in case something were to happen to one of your friends you have all their information. If they're not able to communicate, you have all their information real handy. So again, that's another layer of safety that you can build in. <clears throat> Jack lines. For those of you who don't know what those are, um, it's about a one inch wide uh, uh, synthetic webbing uh, that we attach to the bow and the stern of the boat, runs across the deck that you uh, clip your tether you, the tether that you own <laughs> into. Um, the key here is with jack lines is soak them in water first, uh, probably a good 10, 15 minutes, because once they get wet, they stretch. So once you soak these, you want to put them, uh, attach them to cleats or a real sturdy uh, uh, piece of equipment on the boat, not your uh, lifelines, please. Uh, run them outside and tighten them up as, as much as you physically can tighten them up. When they dry, they're gonna get tighter. But the whole point is you don't want them to be loose and flopping around on the deck. You can still clip on uh, to a, a, a jack line that's under a lot of tension. The other thing I would do, these, these are flat. You don't want, a, you don't want to use a, a line like a sheet or anything like that as a jack line. They tend to stretch a lot more, but they're also round, so they roll under your foot. Uh, it becomes a safety hazard. With jack lines, when you attach them, turn them over so you get a little bit of a curl um, in it. It makes it a lot easier to pick it up uh, off a wet deck. Uh, so it's, it's, if it's flat on the deck, it becomes harder to grab. But if it has a little bit of a twist in it, real easy to pick up. e -perbs, uh, I think we kind of know what those are. Um, they're a little expensive, but uh, the further you go, uh, it might be a consideration. Uh, Spot is really a, a messaging system. Uh, can also you can also configure it to track um, uh, track your progress. Um, you can set it up, to, I think, to uh, transmit like every every hour, uh, a friend of mine crossed the, uh, uh, sailed around the world and he had it set up so that it would uh, ping his location, uh, I think two, twice a day, something like that, every, every 12 hours. You can send little text messages back uh, on that. Uh, if you're doing really long distance sailing uh, and you need more reliable communications, probably uh, the Iridium Go is, is the direction you wanna go there. Um, it gives you uh, satellite communications uh, and uh, you can download uh, weather files when you're offshore. Uh, that's kind of uh, a bit more of the standard today. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the apps that we're going to be looking at here in a bit, uh, you can get SIM cards and plug it into the Iridium Go. So you can get uh, weather routing. Uh, you can do your... Uh, um, uh, passage planning uh, what, uh, based on weather and stuff like that. Bring a sail repair kit. At the very least, uh, you know, they've got a sail tape, whether you have a Dacron sail or uh, something more high tech. If you get a little puncture, sail tape. Uh, if you're going longer distance, then you might want to think about getting a palm and a needle and uh, being able to do, you know, some more serious repairs, stitching. Signaling devices, um, I highly recommend Solus Grade. Don't buy the little uh, cheap kits at West Marine that uh, make you legal. Um, if you've ever gone to a flare shoot, um, 
those things are pretty much worthless. But solace flares, uh, solace grade uh, signaling devices um, are pretty incredible. If you uh, do a test side by side, uh, you definitely want uh, solace grade stuff. Tools. Yeah, you need to work on your auxiliary engine, uh, fix a leaky hose, uh, might have some extra hose clamps, things like that. Uh, there's a discussion about whether you should have a bolt cutter or a hacksaw. Uh, talk about uh, rigging failure. Um, I know there's a couple of you out there that have experienced that. Um, they, I don't have any practical experience with this. I've always had a bolt cutter aboard, but I've been told that uh, a person with a hacksaw can cut through uh, a standing rigging much faster than a person with a bolt cutter. Hmm. Um, so I carry both <laughs> layers of safety, right? Although bolt cutters are pretty darn heavy. Uh, cordless drills. Yeah, you, you guys know uh, you need uh, crescent wrenches, uh, probably have uh, socket wrenches. Uh, I keep both uh, standard type and the metric type. Um, so you need to be able to, again, take care of your boat uh, uh, when you're offshore, if something fails. And of course, we're talking about clevis pins, all that kind of stuff. You know, everybody's boat's a little bit different. Um, you know what you need. Uh, ditch bag. Uh, kind of gets into should you have a life raft. Um, but a ditch bag, you know, you might have some food in it. Uh, certainly a flashlight, spare VHF radio, handheld. Um, uh, I, I have two of them. You might want to uh, dig out that old handheld GPS uh, from 15 years ago and stick that in there, they still work um, and could be useful. So think about what should be in a ditch bag. Uh, you should bring one with, for, especially for longer distance uh, sailing. Obviously plugs for your through hulls. For the crew, I think, I don't think it's this year, but I think next year uh, they're going to require personal locator beacons for every crew member on the MAC race. I got my first one this year. Still have to learn how to use it. Um, they work differently. There are two different kinds. There's the uh, kind that works with uh, GPS and the satellite system. And then there's the type that actually work on VHF so that uh, the, the uh, and it sends an alarm to boats in the immediate area. So you have to think about which one, which type of cruising you're going to be doing. If you're gonna be offshore, obviously the, the satellite GPS version is going to be the one you want because there may not be any boats within VHF range to pick up the signal from the other kind. For sailing on Lake Michigan, maybe the VHF kind uh, is going to be better suited uh, for here. Uh, if there are boats nearby, uh, chances of being picked up and rescued are going to be uh, much quicker than if uh, the uh, GPS uh, uh, satellite kind um, is going to call the Coast Guard. There's going to be a longer lag time for them to get out and help you. Everybody has a PFD, correct? Um, two things I don't sail without now on a PFD are crotch straps and an internal harness. My PFD um, has both. Crotch straps, yeah, they're, they can become uncomfortable, but they do keep the life jacket from going up over your head. And always bring a spare, at least a spare rearming kit. Keep it in a dry bag somewhere on board. Harness and tether. Like I said, the harness on my PFD is integrated. Tether, um, don't buy a cheap tether. It's just as important as your life jacket. They are expensive. They're gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks, but get a high quality one. Even those uh, have been known to fail. So don't get a cheap one, but they have special functions so that you can quickly release it with a single hand. Uh, some of the carabiner type you have to unscrew. Don't get one of those. 
um, buy a real quality tether, uh, at least with uh, uh, 316 stainless steel. Um, and I used to have a six foot tether. I've gotten rid of that one and I'm down to a three foot tether. I find uh, the shorter one to be uh, pretty accurate or adequate, uh, but it does, I do have the six and the three as part of it. Uh, so I usually use the three foot and keep the six foot clipped on somewhere in case I need to go a much longer distance. Uh, flashlights, yeah. Headlamps, I don't go sailing without a headlamp. Uh, it does have a red light and has multiple, multiple brightnesses. Uh, nice thing about the headlamp is keeps your hands free. You have two hands instead of holding a flashlight and trying to do something. So headlamp is really critical for night sailing. Carry a knife. Um, I don't use a Leatherman too much. They're a little heavy. I keep a, a knife that I can open with one hand. Uh, it doesn't take two hands to open. A uh, nice thing to have is a watch bag. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but if somebody's coming on watch at night, it'd be nice for them to be able to grab something and have things that they could use. Uh, sometimes setting up a small thermos of something hot, uh, tea possibly, is good. I uh, don't recommend uh, alcohol and uh, caffeine uh, while sailing, especially at night, uh, because uh, you, the crash from the buzz uh, doesn't help. In the galley, uh, again, you might want to consider a galley strap to keep you held in at the, uh, at the stove uh, if you're in heavy seas. All right. Uh, Paul? Yes. A couple of comments on yes. this. Uh, one of the personal locator beacon types needs to be programmed to your boat. So uh, no, it, I believe it works uh, with DSC. So it should automatically trigger uh, the uh, DSC alarms on the boats in your immediate area. I, I believe that does that, that DSC number needs to be entered into the PLB. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if, if you have people or guests that aren't normally on your boat already, then you'd make sure you'd, you would do that. Um, uh, yeah, and again, again, that becomes a personal decision. Um, if, if you're doing a lot of cruising, you might want to invest uh, yourself okay. in several PLBs and have them registered to the boat. Right. Uh, this, I, I've, I've got a, sorry? This is the, oh, you can't see it, go ahead. I was going to make a comment about the, the tether. Um, I have a, a six foot tether, but it's the type with the bungee inside. Yes. So when it's not, uh, you know, I'm not using it. It's, it's about three feet long. Yeah. And always have the, the quick release side next to you. If you Correct. do fall over and you want to release, you're able to. And some of the newer PFDs have a quick release uh, on the harness itself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, you know, back and forth on whether that's a good thing or not. But um, yeah, the, uh, a good tether um, will have a, a shackle um, th uh, that's supposed to attach the harness on your life jacket. Um, and it's specifically designed so that you can actually release that if the tether's under tension. Uh, so these are little details of, that come along with uh, the, uh, the quality tethers that um, um, are out there. Yeah, but my point was put the end of your tether with that shackle next to you, not right. at the other end, don't hook it up backwards. Correct, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise we're gonna go on here. Spares, we kind of touched about this. Um, not gonna get too deep into this. Other than I want to point out, um, it's really good to take groups of equipment like your nav lights or spare parts or electronics and try to compartmentalize them into um, a container of some sort. It might be a rigid box like you see here in the, the bottom corner of the presentation. Uh, you might have uh, dry bags, you might have the heavy duty freezer Ziploc bags, but compartmentalizing things and packaging them into groups makes it so much easier to find what you need, 
and just reach and pull out what you need without fumbling through a basket or a large bin that has just a whole bunch of stuff in it. You know, sometimes we uh, shove things in behind cushions or uh, in lockers and uh, kind of forget about them, but try to package them up into, into convenient groups uh, in the way that you might use them. We talked about crew. Uh, if you're going long distance sailing, it's really good to have an understanding of the skill sets of the people you're going to be sailing with. Have they been sailing before? Have they not been sailing before? Uh, it's interesting when uh, one of the things I ask in the Skipjacks class at Columbia is uh, when we're looking at winches, <clears throat> uh, uh, we'll have a winch set up and I'll say, you know, if this is on the starboard side and we, we wrap our uh, sheet uh, around the winch in a clockwise fashion, and then we turn around, turn around 180 degrees and we look at the port side winch, which way does the sheet wrap around the winch? And believe it or not, about half the people think that it will wrap counterclockwise on the port side winch versus the starboard winch. So really understanding your crew and using the passage making trip as a training opportunity uh, can be very invaluable. Uh, there should, you know, if you're sailing shorthanded, the other person on the boat with you should uh, also uh, be able to handle the boat uh, on their own. What if you become incapacitated? Can the other person or the other people on the boat safely uh, get the boat to shore? Everybody should obviously know how to handle sheets, uh, how to uh, raise and lower sails, how to trim properly, how to start the engine, how to shut the engine off, how to put it in gear. All of these things um, are really uh, critical to the safety of everybody on the boat. First aid, how many of the crew really know how to uh, treat someone uh, if there's an issue? Can everybody steer or drive the boat? These are things that as a skipper, you should be really thinking about. If there are uh, gaps in, in uh, the skill sets, go, uh, while you're cruising is a great opportunity uh, to get people involved and uh, start learning uh, and expanding their skills in different areas. Uh, some people might have a lot of experience uh, in driving where other people don't. Get that person helping a uh, person who hasn't had a lot of experience driving. Make it a positive experience. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing this for th almost 35 years. And when I go sailing with other people, I usually pick up something new uh, every single time. Knot time. You should know a good five or six knots. And, um, you know, obviously a bowling is a good knot to know, but uh, one of the things I found is uh, a lot of people don't know how to apply a rolling hitch. And that is really, uh, if you have an override on your winch, that's a great knot to know how to utilize. Also, if you're gonna be anchoring out, you need to know how to use a rolling hitch. So look that one up if you don't know what it is or how to use it. Getting along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there's lots we can do to be great crew or skipper. Um, being neat and clean and organized, keep the boat tidy. You don't want uh, to be stumbling over things or uh, unnecessary things laying out. Keep it neat and clean. If the seaway gets kind of nasty, stuff can fly. Make sure that stuff's put away. And keep your gear in specific place have uh, everybody have a specific location to keep their stuff uh, makes it easier for them to find their things mm -hmm. and it also helps to keep things organized paul yes i've got one comment on back on the training something that's available at the safety at sea seminars yes you can get certification for and the mac race has requirements now a certain percentage of your crew has to have that certificate occur yeah. That's the U.S. Sailing Safety at Sea yeah. certification class. Yes, yeah. uh, it's a good class, actually. Yeah. 
especially if you do the, um, the water portion. So let's see, getting along. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, this is just about keeping things neat and organized. But I think one of the critical things for me um, uh, that I recognize in uh, people, uh, inviting people out, is them taking the initiative to, uh, to ask questions, to be curious, to want to learn, and want to help out. That, for me, is um, having a positive attitude and wanting to be involved is uh, really uh, makes the whole experience much better for everybody. Navigation. Now, back in the day when I started sailing, um, we did not have GPS. We are so fortunate these days um, to have all these cool electronics, GPS, AIS, radar, all these different tools, depth sounders, uh, speedos, wind speed indicators. Um, you know, back in the day, you wet your finger and stuck it in the air, and uh, yeah, it was windy. Obviously, you should understand how to use GPS. They've really kind of um, become, there's not much to really learn other than, uh, you know, how to operate the device itself. They're, they're quite reliable. Um, there's some discussion whether um, uh, G5 technology uh, on phones is going to uh, create an issue there. Um, but, you know, the chart plotters today are, are wonderful. Um, they can tell you pretty accurately when you're going to get somewhere, um, save the wind. But, you know, electronics, electrical systems can fail. Um, I always bring paper charts. Uh, and the tools uh, to be able to use them. Um, dividers, um, pencils, and so on and so forth, even a little calculator, but that's on my cell phone these days. I still bring a dumb one with. Uh, we talked about coastal pilot and light lists. I'm not gonna go there. I do keep logs. Um, and depending on the, the trip you're doing will uh, indicate or dictate you know, how frequently you're gonna update those logs. I always write down the latitude and longitude. Um, I will describe the sea state and the weather. Um, I will also uh, obviously put down the time and a few other details. But if for some reason um, the electrical system goes down and I, I have to rely on paper charts, I can go back and plot where I've been and I can pretty much uh, dead reckon to where I need to go. So again, layers of safety. AIS transponders are starting to become a bit more popular. You, like I said, you find them mostly on commercial ships these days. Uh, there are two classes, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, class A um, run, uh, you find those mostly on the commercial vessels. And they are transceivers. In other words, they transmit and receive. Class B, I believe, are found more on recreational uh, vessels. And if, I'm, if I recall correctly, they, I think they transmit more on the VHF frequency than GPS or satellite. So their range on class B tends to be more limited, uh, something like uh, 10 miles you know, up, up to the horizon, just like a VHF radio. If anybody knows more about those, uh, feel free to speak up. Know the rules of the road. Uh, pretty straightforward here on Lake Michigan, but if you're gonna be in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, down in Florida, uh, south coast of Florida, uh, uh, California, uh, knowing the rules of the road and being able to uh, identify a variety of different vessels uh, becomes a bit more critical. Uh, there are inland rules, which uh, we have here on Lake Michigan, uh, international rules, uh, you know, if you're doing a transatlantic passage, uh, slightly different. The book you see here is uh, from the Coast Guard and it has everything in it. Uh, you can pick that up at West Marine. Uh, lights, know your uh, lights, uh, you can get 
it can be pretty confusing coming into Chicago at night if uh, you haven't done that. Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, find the, uh, the channel markers um, and uh, Lighthouse is pretty clear, but trying to find uh, the red and green on Monroe Harbor against all the lights in Chicago become a bit different. But even more importantly, know the lights uh, configurations on certain vessels. On Lake Michigan, it's pretty straightforward. You're gonna see the big freighters um, a long ways off. Uh, they are big. And um, everybody kind of knows what the uh, light configuration is on sailboats and power boats. I'm gonna get into this a little bit more. Uh, know your aids to navigation, uh, buoys, channel markers, red right returning in the United States. It's the opposite in Europe. Sailing motoring. Um, we'll go through this. Um, you should really have an idea what uh, the fuel consumption is on your auxiliary at a variety of speeds and in various sea states. Um, on my last boat, I knew on a calm day, motoring a little bit slower than max RPMs, uh, I was pretty between three quarters to uh, um, a, a gallon of diesel fuel uh, per hour, which was about six nautical miles. As the sea state built up, you're going to burn more fuel and uh, you're probably going to be running at slightly higher RPMs. So you should know what the com uh, fuel consumption is uh, for that. I also keep that in a log. Your fuel tank capacity, obviously. Uh, I don't trust the fuel gauge on, on mine. Uh, there was one at the nav station and one on the tank, and they were always a quarter tank off from each other. So if you fill up your fuel tank and you keep track of your fuel consumption or the amount of time you've been running your engine, the next time you fill it up will give you a good indication of what your, uh, your fuel burn uh, is. Long distance sailing, you might need fuel, uh, uh, jerry cans for fuel, you might need jerry cans for water as well. And just know that as you're motoring, your apparent wind's gonna change. Any questions here? Uh, we're gonna get into this just a little bit more though. Does anybody here have any direct experience with class A and B AIS transponders? Yes. This is Bradley here. Yeah. Um, the AIS, we have um, transmit and receive on Rat Race, and it's a real game changer. I mean, at, at night, you can tell how fast and in what direction boats are going. Uh, poops out right on your um, GPS screen. So oh, very nice. Which uh, which one do you have, the A or the B? Um, have the B. Okay. And can that transmit and receive? Um, well, I didn't set it all up, so I maybe I don't know all the technical details. Um, okay. But we do transmit and receive now. Okay. Cool. We we started. I think you can just get a VHF uh, for receive. Yes. But you have to add uh, something else um, to transmit an actual transmitter. Yeah. Um, but uh, on the way back from Mac some time ago, uh, it really helped to have it on Truant as well. Um, you know, we saw a big freighter and were able to, you know, divert pretty easily to, to miss it. Yeah. Uh, for well. those. Yeah, for those of you who don't have AIS, uh, there are a couple of apps um, and uh, websites uh, that will uh, give you an idea of the value of, of AIS. Uh, I frequently look at it and you can see freighters going up and down Lake Michigan. Uh, you can see the tugs and uh, barges going up and down the rivers and, uh, and such. Uh, some of the, even some of the, uh, <coughs> tour boats off Navy Pier and, and so on and so forth. And they're color coded by the type of vessel as well. But like uh, was just said, once you uh, click on a particular ship icon, you can get a lot of data. You'll get the name uh, of the vessel, its speed, its heading, uh, its home port and destination, I think are you know some of the, the basic information you can get. 
Another awesome part about it is that typically your GPS will give you some collision uh, information if you're anywhere close to colliding with it, like um, closest pass um, and that time when you have your closest pass. Okay, do you know if you can set up an alarm for that? Can you set up a proximity alarm? So if, if a vessel's within say five nautical miles, uh, alarm goes off. Okay, I, I know you can do that on radar. So just curious if you can do that with an AIS. Yeah, and Brad, if you're trying to talk, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, can you set up a proximity alarm with an AIS transponder? I think you, yes, absolutely you can. Uh, mine just goes off um, if I don't have it set correctly. Uh, um, even if I'm at anchor or, you know, moored somewhere. Okay. Cool. Um, so we've kind of gone over a lot of <laughs> equipment and crew related stuff. Uh, weather is always, I think that was the the first thing somebody brought up when I was uh, asking what your concerns were. Weather is always a concern. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that here. Weather watches. Uh, yeah, before we go, we're dialed into what the forecast is. When we're leaving, we're dialed into what the forecast is. While we're sailing, we wanna know what the forecast is, right? Uh, we can rely on a lot of different resources. Uh, good old Tom Skilling, there's tons of apps out there now. Uh, we might have radar on our, our ship. Uh, we have cell phones if we're close enough to shore. Uh, we have all these uh, technological resources that we rely on. And uh, you may have heard uh, one of the best things is to, uh, there's a phrase, keep your head out of the ship. In other words, don't rely on your electronics uh, so much. Get a feeling for what the boat's doing and what's going on around you. And it's very true with weather as well. Um, rely on all of your, your senses. You can learn so much from visual clues. There might be a glow around the sun that tells you that uh, there might be weather coming in in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you can look at the clouds, right? Uh, you can look at the sea state. It, all of a sudden, maybe the wave, uh, the waves are coming from a different direction. Uh, there's all sorts of visual clues that you can utilize to evaluate uh, what's going on around you. Uh, there might be changes in the wind direction, the strength and temperature. Uh, we were in a Mac race a few years ago where we had a spinnaker up. It was two in the morning. Um, and we're ghosting along at maybe two knots. And all of a sudden, you know, there was a bit of a wind shift and we we're sailing 150 degrees the other direction. And so we jived over or tacked over, probably jived over and uh, we had another wind shift. And fortunately there were boats, you know, it's a Mac race so you could see other boats and uh, off in the, to the west of us, we could see a couple boats harden up and start sailing fast. So we knew that there was something coming. We took down the chute, got the jib up, and all of a sudden the air temperature got real cold. And within a minute, we went from about five knots of apparent to about 40 knots of wind. And the 45 foot sprit boat behind us got knocked over on its side because they, they weren't paying attention. You can also use uh, changes uh, in the air, the smell or the sounds around you uh, to, this, these become extremely uh, useful at nighttime, but you can use it during the daytime. Your, uh, your senses should be a little bit more heightened. Um, you can get this from uh, the National Weather Service. Uh, keep a copy on my boats and uh, good idea. Uh, I, I don't remember all the cloud formations. Uh, keep them in my head. So this is a nice quick reference. We, we certainly know what these are down here. Uh, squall lines, frontal, 
frontal uh, zones uh, should have a decent understanding of uh, what what a high pressure zone does, what a low pressure zone does, um, which ways they rotate, uh, what kind of weather they bring, and so on. Any questions on, I know we kind of like flew through weather. I didn't want to spend a tremendous amount of time on it, but uh, any questions on that? Any comments? Okay. Sailing at night. Um, I think sailing at night is one of the coolest experiences. I absolutely love it. Uh, sometimes it's pitch black out and all you can see is the, uh, the lights on the bow of the boat. Uh, in fact, I get uh, what I usually do is I go to the hardware store and get uh, some black tape, the flat kind, not the shiny kind, and I wrap it around the bow pulpit because the lights reflect back uh, on the, the bow pulpit of the boat at night and become very distracting. But uh, sometimes the moon is not out and you have a clear sky and just stars and that will light up you can see so clearly just under starlight. Uh, in fact, I almost prefer to sail without the moon. It almost gets too bright um, and it kind of ruins your, your eyesight. Sailing at night, red lights are key. Uh, they preserve your eyesight. Watch schedules. I don't want to get into deeply on watch schedules because it really varies so much by the number of people you have on the boat and how long you're going to be out on the water. Um, if, they're, if you're sailing by yourself, your watch schedule is going to be considerably different than if there are two of you or if there are four of you or if there are eight of you. Uh, just be aware that there are a lot of different kinds of watch schedules. And to some extent, you have to kind of figure out what's working for your crew. Uh, you might want to do four hours on, four hours off, or you might want to do three hours on, six hours off. It really depends on the number of people on the boat. Um, most of the times during the daytime, the watch schedule becomes a lot looser but at nighttime it's, it's, it's completely structured. So it really depends on what you feel comfortable with and uh, what your sleeping patterns are. So uh, there's a lot of information out there about uh, watch schedules, watch keeping. Yep, uh, the whole purpose is to keep an eye out for other stuff. Make sure the, the boat's sailing along properly, sails are trimmed, you're not gonna hit anything watch out for other boats, you know, uh, whether it's visual or monitoring uh, radar, AIS, chart plotter, watching the weather changes. What if the wind shifts um, and keeping a log? Uh, you're also um, responsible for waking up the next watch. Uh, usually a good 10 minutes beforehand is enough time to shake someone out of the bunk and <clears throat> uh, kind of get reorientated. Um, you may want to have an overlapping watch schedule so that um, the first part of the next on watch uh, person or group has a time to become acclimated or accustomed to what's going on and kind of get up to speed with uh, where you're at, what the sailing conditions are like and so on. It takes a little bit to wake up. We've talked about jack lines and tethers. Uh, I don't go sailing long distance without jack lines and tethers. Um, I prefer to stay on the boat than uh, relying on someone to uh, turn the boat around and come uh, pick me up out of the water. So should I be clipped in? <clears throat> yeah. Um, and it, it kind of varies, you know, if it's, if it's a quiet summer evening, it's two o'clock in the morning and you're ghosting along at five knots um, in flat waters, you know, yeah, definitely PDF at nighttime. Um, should you be clipped in? Maybe. Um, I, generally speaking, I do. Uh, Single-handed watches. If you're in that situation um, and you need to make an adjustment outside of the cockpit, definitely bring somebody up 
uh, wake somebody up and have them come in the cockpit um, and supervise what you're doing so that if, if something does happen, somebody has eyes on you. If you're out there and you're thinking, geez, I wonder if I should reef, the answer is yes. Uh, it's easier to reef when conditions are better than when the shit hits the fan. Uh, so uh, it's easier to reef then and flake out a reef uh, if you don't need it than to put one in uh, after the point of when you've needed it. So yes. Standard lights, I think all of you know these. Um, if you see a red or green light and a, and a white uh, light in combination, you know it's a power boat. Uh, if you just see a single light, you know it's a sailboat, right? However, um, you should study uh, the various light combinations. You're not gonna to see too many combinations around here. Uh, you're gonna see sail and power boats. You're gonna see the freighters. But the only one I wanna point out is that you might see a yellow light. And at distance, it will look like a white light. A yellow light typically on Lake Michigan means uh, it's a tugboat pulling a barge. And the key here is if a tugboat's pulling a barge, uh, it's gonna display a yellow light. There's usually a three or 500 foot steel cable between the barge and the tugboat. Uh, I've seen that a couple of times out on the lake at night. Um, and those are typically the, the light combinations you're gonna see. So just be mindful of that one because it, the first time I saw this, it took me about a half hour, 45 minutes to figure out what the light combination was because the supposed little white light, which turned out to be a yellow light uh, behind the tugboat on the barge, they were keeping pace with the tugboat's lights. And we couldn't figure out why there would be a, a little single white light uh, keeping pace with the tugboat light combination. Um, it, it just didn't make sense. But as we got closer, we could see, oh, that wasn't a white light, it was a yellow light and there's a steel cable in between. You don't wanna go between the tug and the barge. Any questions on lighting, on lights real quick? No, okay, cool. Um, didn't get into sound signals, but if technically, if you're in fog, you're supposed to uh, uh, sound uh, either with uh, a well, typically with a bell, so. I thought I would collect a few uh, of resources that I've come to like over the years. Um, obviously, uh, to check, uh, when I'm checking weather forecasts and stuff, I wanna see what's happening on a, a large scale. So one of the first things I do is I check the, uh, the buoys out in Lake Michigan, uh, the North and South Lake Michigan buoys. Uh, I, the South one, I believe, is, is kind of between uh, what Racine and, and due east of Racine out in the middle of the lake and the other one's up in the uh, top end of Lake Michigan. It's interesting to see the wind direction uh, changes there. There's also uh, good old NOAA, uh, the weather forecast, whether it's on the VHF, the text ones, uh, the NOAA text ones come out roughly speaking um, at nine in the morning and nine at night, three in the morning uh, and three at night afternoon. Uh, I usually check those. Uh, they're reasonably accurate, quite frankly. And obviously if we're going out uh, off Chicago, the Deaver Crib, I'm sure everybody knows about that one. Uh, I bookmark these on my cell phone. Um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers is great for lake levels. Um, uh, we're down about 11 inches this year. Yay. <laughs> I will actually be able to uh, step onto docks instead of down to them. One of my favorite apps is Wonderground. Uh, they have a section called Wonder Map. 
And what's cool about that is as storms come in, it actually shows uh, vectors, uh, the direction in which they're traveling and shows, uh, tries to predict how uh, soon it's going to arrive. I think it breaks it out in, in 20 minute incre in increments. Another little app uh, is my radar and obviously the weather channel. Uh, for navigation, I'm using Navionics. Uh, if you're into the free stuff, OpenCPN is an awesome one. Um, it's extremely accurate. It's, I think it's as good as Navionics. Uh, I'm just comfortable with using Navionics mostly because I can sync up uh, data between my desktop computer, my iPad, and my cell phone. So if I'm creating pre-planning pre routes, I can do that on a desktop computer or an iPad, and it appears right on my cell phone uh, through my account. Uh, I'd like to mention iNavX. It's okay. Yeah. not free, but it's pretty inexpensive. It's $20 or something. iNavX is another really, really good one, yes. I think Navionics is maybe 15 bucks and uh, uses, uh, I just use the government charts and because not much changes on Lake Michigan, uh, you don't really have to update them that frequently. So, but yeah, iNavix, OpenCPN, Navionics are kind of the uh, industry standard right now. Uh, a couple of my other favorite ones, uh, the Windy app. Uh, sail flow is, is really kind of cool because it pulls up the, uh, um, the weather stations uh, in the area and uh, you can real quickly see what the uh, wind and direction conditions are uh, over a, a greater area. And then when you click on a specific location or weather reporting station, you can get a lot more granular detail. Uh, this is a, the NOAA one here is actually just a bookmark. It's not really an app. Uh, and I have these uh, set up for specific uh, buoys and weather reporting stations uh, that I more frequently use. Predict Wind is really cool for um, offshore weather routing. So uh, by example, if you're sailing from uh, say San Francisco to Hawaii, uh, you can uh, pick the day that you're going to leave and it will give you, it will uh, create a, 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 an optimal route based on your boat speed and the weather conditions that you expect to see at a given time. So it will give you a, a, an optimal uh, route to get to your destination based on weather and time. Which, uh, which that, tool was that? Uh, predict wind. Okay. Um, cool. And it also uh, integrates uh, with a SIM card on the Iridium Go, the satellite navigation uh, device. Uh, so if you were offshore, say in that last example, you're halfway to Hawaii, you can still get updates uh, and, uh, and stuff and it will, it will update your route. And you can also use it to report back uh, to friends and stuff uh, what your location is. Uh, so they can stay in touch and you can, because it's satellite based, you can also uh, uh, send emails and messages. You can download grid files. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. So predict wind and Iridium go. If you're doing uh, a transatlantic or a Pacific uh, trip, uh, that's kind of what they're using out there for that uh, situation. Not so much here on Lake Michigan, but uh, you might just use the Predict Wind app if you're going up to um, the north end of Lake Michigan or whatever. Uh, two, three day trip would be uh, a good use of that. Um, there's another app, GFS Models. Uh, that's pretty much the grid files. Uh, so if you're kind of a, a weather nerd, uh, that uh, there was another one I didn't have a chance to get in here that uh, you can also get grid files. And if you are not really familiar with ship's lights, this is a really cool little app. Uh, I know it's on the iPhone. Um, it's uh, sort of like a, a quiz uh, app. Uh, takes you through just about every con conceivable uh, light combination that you'll see on 
just about every type of ship, whether it's coming at you, you're looking at the port or starboard side or at stern. Um, it's, it's really a fun little thing and you can learn quite a lot from just that little app. So that's really kind of it. Um, here's some uh, learning on uh, resources. Uh, obviously, Columbia Yacht Club is an awesome place to do that. We're doing that here today. We've been doing that with Cruising Fleet the past couple of weeks. Uh, if you want to build your skills, there's lots of opportunities at the club. Um, U.S. Sailing has all sorts of classes. U.S. Power Squadron, that's where I got my original um, uh, introduction to boating. And as previously mentioned, the U.S. Sailing Safety at Sea Certification, it's, it's really a, a, a great uh, program. It's, you can either do the one day or the two day. Uh, one day is classroom, the two day is in water. And there are a lot of storm tactic books out there. Um, nine, what is it, 99 Days Drift. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, cool stuff out there to read. Experience. Um, I think it was, was it Ron or somebody was saying they've been sailing 30 years on other people's boats. That's really a great way to learn because you can pick up so much from different people's, uh, from different individual skills, what they've learned over the years. If you haven't done much racing, um, I would kind of recommend you get out there on beer cans and maybe even some weekend races because your skill level is going to increase significantly uh, more quickly uh, just from those particular uh, experiences. Um, you can also sign up for deliveries, uh, head out and go do the Caribbean 1500. Uh, the ARC uh, is the uh, Atlantic Rally. Um, they go from the US to Europe and then they come back, I think it's uh, mid-November uh, from the Canaries to the Caribbean. Um, so there's lots of really good opportunities to build your experience uh, experiences out there if you search it. Um, on the right here is a book uh, from Suzanne. She's a young Dutch girl. Uh, she's written a book on how to basically uh, hitch rides on sailboats <laughs> crossing the Atlantic and stuff. That's a pretty cool book uh, if you're interested in, in doing stuff like that. But all in all, we're out there to have fun. And um, it's really each one of our own responsibilities to make sure that uh, not only are we having fun, but the other people around us uh, are having a good time as well. Um, and if we're not having a good time, then uh, you have to kind of question why we're out there in the first place. So that's really the presentation for today. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming. I hope it's been informative. I'll hang out here for a little bit if anybody has you know, some more specific questions they wanna talk about. I didn't get into electrics. Uh, one of the things happening these days is I think we're really uh, starting to see uh, a transformation with sailboats. I'm starting to see a big uh, switch to uh, get rid of diesel engines and a move towards electric engines um, and all the, the electrical systems that have to go along with that. Uh, there's a company in Croatia that's building uh, 40 foot electric sailboats. So it's coming and I think it's going to give us a lot more freedom and independence uh, in the cruising world. So that's it. Thank you for coming.